Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. It's great to see you this morning. Glad you're in church. Uh, we're in the middle of this 40-day prayer experiment where uh, many of us have been uh, asking God, God, what do you want us to pray for for 40 days? Something specific, something that only God can do, something he's putting on our heart. We've been praying for that, and uh, we're working towards our 40 days. Meanwhile, we're learning how to pray, and, uh, and we're working our way through the Lord's Prayer uh, which, where Jesus teaches us how to pray. And uh, one morning I was working on a message of prayer to share with you guys, and the thought went through my head, uh, give them something other than what you've learned, Jim. Uh, give them your mentor. And, uh, and so I called up uh, Dr. Terry Teekel and asked if he'd come and preach today. He was my pastor when I was in college. When I was uh, beginning to hear God's voice to go into ministry, this is one of the ways that God spoke to me is through my college pastor. And um, if you could pick just three people in the whole nation to, to learn from on prayer, this would be one of the three. Uh, KSBJ radio station here in Houston uh, has uh, yoked with Terry, and uh, he consults them and mentors them and ministers to them in prayer. Uh, the whole idea of pray down at noon uh, it was an idea that came uh, through, from God through Terry to KSBJ. And uh, just would you welcome me as Terry comes and, and brings God's word to us this morning. Thank you. Uh, I always remember, uh, I've come here about four times now. And I remember the time that y'all were all sitting on a horse in here because this was a horse arena. And uh, God spoke to your pastor that this should be your worship room, and it's become a nice worship room. Uh, we're the sheep of his pasture, but I guess it's okay if we meet in a horse shed rather than a sheep pen. So there you go. Uh, it's been exciting to be a part of KSBJ and inviting people to start pray the Lord's Prayer from uh, Beaumont to College Station to Victoria to Huntsville to all of Houston and, uh, and to monitor the results of that. And we had prayed, uh, just inviting our listeners, where we, how many of you pray the prayer at noon, the Lord's Prayer? Oh, my, so many hands. I'll tell Tim McDermott, the, the manager of KSBJ. But uh, we did it for a year. And then the Chronicle came out with these headlines. Violent crime in Houston shows a sharp decrease for no explicable reason. <laughs> I blame the Lord's Prayer on that. Deliver us from evil. And then uh, just this last year, as it began to snowball and more and more people, I don't know how many thousands just at noon say the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes you'll come to a red light and somebody next to you will be praying. Uh, but um, this was city murders in uh, 2012 termed incredibly low for no explicable reason. I'm laying the Lord's Prayer uh, that he is disbanding evil. He is curtailing crime. He is uh, doing those things in answer to this powerful cadence of prayer, of people marching together at the same hour. And my goal is to make the Guinness Book of World Records by having more people praying at the same time every day. I'll go into the record books as the person who did that. Of course, all of us who stand here know that we're results of somebody out here praying. And I have a lady here that's, I'm re, the reason I'm here today praying or teaching whatever I'm doing is because of this lady. Uh, is Corrine, where's Corrine at? Would you, would you stand up, Corrine? She's in the room somewhere. I can't see because I have these headlights in my eyes. Over here? Wait, right. Thank you, Corrine, for praying for me. She happens to be my sister, too. And that's really neat to have a sister. I really love your pastor. Of all the pastors I know, uh, Jim Leggett maintains his boundaries more than any other pastor that I know. He, he knows his family is foremost, his church is second, and he focuses on what God's told him to do. 
Uh, he won't go to lunch with people unless he feels like it's a part of his, God's purpose for his life. Uh, if you get an email from him, it's usually five words, maybe ten, the most, because he's focused on what he's supposed to do. Uh, I remember a lady called the church one day, and she says, uh, no, it's a guy. He said, uh, called his secretary and said, my dog has died, and I would like for Jim to do the funeral. Of course, she went in and told Jim, and Jim said, well, that's got a character with me, burying a dog. I mean, I, I'm... I, <laughs> and she said, well, he, he was going to give a big offering to the Bible school, Bible seminary, if you did it. So Jim called him back and said, I didn't realize it was a Methodist dog. Uh, buried him right over here, right in that field, right down there. <laughs> Dog got to come on church property to be buried. Uh, of course, having for the last six years uh, promoting prayer at noon, saying the Lord's Prayer, uh, I guess I've accrued some equity in it. So it is applicable for me to come and talk about the Lord's Prayer because I've, I've got a lot invested in it in terms of equity, so I'd like to draw on that. And uh, if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew 6, and your last Sunday, I think you dealt with, give us this day our daily bread. And Jim probably told you that the Greek word for daily bread was not found in any manuscripts until later it was found in some domestic manuscripts. And people really had thought Jesus made up the word. But the word daily bread means grocery list. So when you go to H-E-B to get coffee, toilet paper, and uh, dish soap, that's what Jesus was saying. He wants us to have our daily needs met. And I'm sure Jim proclaimed that. And that's an awesome, awesome thought. Well, then Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, understands us, loves us, and probably deals with something that's the most crucial in our lives and that's our ability to sin, fall short, and, and do things that we shouldn't do. So he just deals with that right here in this passage. So let's read uh, Matthew 6, 9 through 12. Is it on the screen? Let's read it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And forgive us. Now, some translations, actually the original translation says, and forgive us our debts. Uh, we have a debt. Forgive that. Remember the first uh, church I went to, actually the second church, there was a, a desire on my part to win everybody in town to Christ. So I picked the worst ones first, knowing that they'd be the dominoes that would knock other dominoes down. And there was Gene. And Gene was sort of the, he was the town drunk. And he was drunk all the time. And so it was kind of hard to get through to Gene because he was drunk. <laughs> but one uh, like late Saturday night, I went to his little shack and I found him sober. And so I said, Gene, I, you know I want you to become a Christian. You know I would really desire for you to accept Jesus Christ. And, and he began to cry, and he told me this story. He says, I was in World War II. One day, I actually pointed my rifle at a German soldier, and I shot him and killed him. He said, it began to dawn on me that I just shot someone's son, or I just shot someone's father, or I just shot someone's husband. And he said... The debt of that guilt has caused me so much pain, I drink alcohol because it's the only across-the-counter painkiller I can get. And so here was a man who had a debt that he could not pay, and the debt was eating him alive. 
And sometimes we pray, uh, a lot of the mainline denominations pray, forgive us our trespasses. A trespass is when you go somewhere where you shouldn't go, and you do something maybe you shouldn't do. I remember seeing a sign on a fence. The sign said this, no trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted to the nth degree of the law. Signed, Sisters of Mercy Convent. <laughs> Just something a little bit incongruous about that. Sign on a convent fence. But some of us went somewhere and did something we shouldn't have done. We did cross a boundary and we either said something or we did something that today we're ashamed of. And so Jesus is being saying, now let's be honest about this. Let's just say, forgive us of where we went. We trespassed. And this is what the translation says, forgive us of our wrongs. Not so much our sins and trespasses, but our wrongs. Uh, maybe something that we should have done that we didn't do. Maybe, uh, I think of Peter, for example, standing by the charcoal fire, denying Jesus three times, and then melting in the wrongness of the moment and realizing what he had done, that he denied Jesus three times, and that this was so uh, disheartening to him that he could say, forgive me of my wrong." But, you, but when we come to this passage, Jesus wouldn't have taught us to pray this unless he knew this. The Father is eager to forgive us. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess, well, actually, the first verse says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, it's interesting, the word is plural for sins here. The most serious sin, singular, is to refuse Jesus. And the Bible talks about uh, that sin, but then the plural sins of the number of things that we may have done. And the word to confess is simply say, okay, I did it. I agree with you, Father, that I have done this. And then the next verse in chapter 2 says this, my dear children, just sense the tenderness of this, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You know what an advocate is? It's, it's someone who goes to bat for you. Someone who comes alongside and says, Father, uh, they are created in your image. Father, I, I know they've messed up, but on the cross, I died for their sins. Father, and he pleads your case with the Father when we've messed up. It is so nice to know that we have an advocate that stands at the right hand of God pleading our case. And this, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Uh, someone said the word atonement would su suffice because it means at one -ment. So that we're put at one with God for our sins, not only for our sins, but for the sins of all those countries she just mentioned that I couldn't pronounce. That was pretty good. Where are you? I've, so there is a debt, there is a trespass, there is a wrong, there is a sin. But it says in John 19.30, would you put that on the screen? But when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It's interesting, in none of the four Gospels does it say he died. But he gave up his spirit. But the word here, here's the last thing Jesus said on the earth before his resurrection. 
it is finished. Now, you may think, well, he was thinking the cross is finished, the suffering's over with, I'm going to die now and be resurrected. But that word finished is a powerful word because it's the word telestai. And Jesus chose it very well. Of all the words he could choose, he chose that word because that word meant this. If you owed something and someone paid it, it was called finished. The account is over with telestai. So that Jesus offers us a debt to be paid a trespass to be dealt with by offering, by saying, it is finished. I paid a price. Sometimes I have people tell me, you know, this arthritis in my hand is my pain for my suffering. God is punishing me by having pain in my hand. Well, and I told that person, I said, listen, the nail that went in Jesus' hand was the only pain necessary for your sin. He paid it all. You don't have to pay coupons. You don't have to rip out a coupon and say, that I'm going through this, or, or God took this from me, or I've lost this, or I'm having this because God's punishing me. Jesus died on the cross once and for all, a sufficient sacrifice for all. The account is telestai. It is paid. Psalms 103, would you put that? The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Just tell the person next to you, aren't you glad you didn't get what you deserve? <laughs> I am. We did not get what we deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. For as far as the east is from the west. You know how far that is? Start going east and you'll never meet west because you're going east. <laughs> you didn't know I was a physicist, did you? Or go west, and you'll never meet east because you're going west. And you can go for infinity. He said, that's how far away your sins are. You can't even see them with binoculars. For as, for as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. If you'll confess them, he'll say, here, I'll take them. They're mine. They're going to go to the east or they're going to go to the west, and you'll never see them again. How do you remain so calm with what I'm telling you? <laughs> Look at uh, Malachi, uh, Micah, excuse me, Micah 7, verse 18. I was uh, actually, I was raised in honky tonks. Where I never did learn much about religion or Bible, and I can't really pronounce Bible words. Uh, I'm just, I just, even though I'm a professor at the Bible seminary, I have a hard time with words in the Bible. I used to call the book of uh, Malachi the book of Malachi. <laughs> and I would tell my congregation, open to the book of Jobs and we'll get you one. <laughs> and I would preach about the Ethiopian uh, uh, unch. <laughs> Eunuch, not unch whatever that is. But who is like our God who pardons sin, forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? I mean, the parole board doesn't even vote. He just pardons your sin. There's no vote here. You do not say that, that he, you do not stay angry forever. But listen, but delight to show mercy. In other words, when you come to God with this confession here, he's glad to see you. He's not mad at you. He's not holding a grudge against you. He doesn't, uh, sometimes, you know, as married couples, we kind of like practice archaeology. We'll dig something up from the past and put it on exhibit. My wife will say, you know what you said to me in 1984 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon that I was getting bigger? I remember that. 
Well, I thought she was lifting weights. But <laughs> sometimes we dig around in the past. But this passage says that he, look, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread on our sins underfoot and hurl, hurl all our iniquities into the Indian Ocean right off the coast of Australia. That's the biggest and deepest ocean there is on the face of the earth. And that's where your sins are put. And on the Australian beaches, there's a sign, no fishing. <laughs> that we don't dig around in the past and find those failures and find those mistakes and find those addictions and find those stuff that we did because they're in the sea. Actually, the word for forgiveness is shayla, and that's a a divine word that only God uses. It's, it's his prerogative to use that word for forgiveness. Think about this. Jesus resurrected from the dead, defeated death and devil and hell and all. And what is the first thing he do? He does. Does he go to CNN, open a Facebook account, Twitter somebody? No. The first thing he does is goes to the man who denied him, Peter. And what does he do? He builds a charcoal fire. Gets charcoal, builds a fire. And right by the fire, kind of like Peter denied him, he gave him three times to say, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? How anxious God is to get us back, to pull us into himself to forgive and forget. It says here, he forgets. You know, God is a God is all knowing and he's a powerful God. And he made everything, but when it comes to your sins, he can't remember them. He's forgetful. So I'm thinking, if he can't remember them, why should I remember them? Why should I sit on the counselor's couch going over and over and over what I did to her? When Jesus died on the cross, paid that debt, and the Father hurled it like a into the sea. So he no longer knows that. No fishing allowed. That Jesus in his resurrection did that for Peter. That we don't have to walk around the graves of the past, exhuming skeletons and reburying them. That we don't have to let our ego take out a whip and beat us up, beat us up, because we did that. Actually, ego stands for easing God out. <laughs> that when we're in control, uh, the ego is in control. And we suffer the shame and the guilt of... Uh... So... Point being, and this is our appropriate day, is to be honest and say, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. I trespassed. I wronged. I, I blew it. But I'm here for you to cleanse me of all unrighteousness and to forgive me. Psalms 51.3, for I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. For against you and you alone have I sinned. In other words, when your sin is always before you, it's a dangerous place to be because you're, uh, you're in danger of repeating it because you're thinking about it all the time. But when he does forgive us, when we are bathed in his mercy and we know his restoration, uh, Psalms 51, 12 says... Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. After the forgiveness comes the restoration of joy. And then in Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. No cost involved your willingness to come and repent.
and ask him, Father, forgive me. It's a powerful principle here. It's so powerful it started the United Methodist Church. For in uh, 1738, John Wesley went to a prayer meeting. He's the founder of our movement. He was an Anglican priest, as uh, Jim has pointed out to you. Uh, He said he went unwillingly to this prayer meeting on Aldersgate Street. Uh, Someone was reading Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Then he said about a quarter till nine, he was describing the change that God works in a person's heart. And he said, suddenly, my heart was strangely warmed. And this is what he said. I felt that I didn't trust Christ. And Christ alone for salvation and assurance was given to me that he has taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Well, that was 277 years ago, and we went from Aldersgate Street to Mason Road (laughs) because of the power of that forgiveness. That's why he says, he adds here in this next passage, uh, as we forgive our debtors, or we forgive those who trespass against us. Little boy was heard praying, Father, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who press trash against me. (laughs) He got it right. There are people who press trash against us. They say things about you. They take advantage of you. They pull out in front of you. They make signs at you. (laughs) I was, uh, but he says this, if you forgive men, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, then your Father will not forgive you. Because the problem in that is that when we don't forgive, we fall into judgment. And judgment causes us to repeat that which we will not forgive. Because he has abundantly forgiven us. Get this. Listen carefully. Forgiveness is the gift that keeps on giving. I was at the car show last weekend, and there was this million-dollar race car there. I only can't pronounce the name of it, but it had a V12, and I was standing there just looking at it, and suddenly this big arm shoved me aside and almost knocked me down. He said, get out of the way, fellow. I'm going to take a picture of this car. Now, this was my moment. Was I going to be Velcro or Teflon? Because see, when we don't forgive, we become, we have a Velcro t- personality. We hang the hurt. We retain the saying. The action was done and we remember it. It's in our book of records because we, we let that thing attach to us, what was said or done to us. But when you forgive, you have a Teflon personality. I know this is corny, but when people get old, they can be corny, and they don't care. (laughs) It slips away like water on a duck. I said, sure, take five pictures. I'll move. I'm I'm glad you can take pictures. Maybe you can buy one someday uh, and race it real fast. Uh, uh, I didn't go any further than that (laughs) because I was trying to be Teflon, not Velcro. Uh, so that we can forgive others, even as he's forgiven us. The misunderstandings, the offenses slip off and don't register. In other words, we're not easily angered, and we keep no record of wrongs, because love protects, love trusts, love hopes, and love always perseveres. Love will not fail. That's the preamble for the forgiveness that we offer. So, shame will come. Guilt will come. The remembrance of what happened. And you will think, I don't know how I did that. I know better. My pastor has taught me better. I was raised better than that. And yet, look what I've done. 
And sometimes shame and guilt will try to rob you of the moment to cause a repeat. But there is a way to foil the robbers, and that is to pray instantly. Forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Give me as much forgetfulness about my past as you do. Because if you forgot it, why should I drag it up? This is good preaching today. I'm really glad I came. You know, when, when a preacher really preaches good, you know who they're preaching to? Themselves. <laughs> well, let me close. There's a, we're getting testimonies of people who are praying the Lord's Prayer at noon through KSBJ. And uh, this young girl called one day to talk to two of our disc jockeys to tell this story. I'd like you to hear uh, Angie's story. Would you play that for me? Uh... I wanted to tell you something. I'm going to try to say this without crying. It was the first time I had heard that on the radio, and I was on my way home from work, and, and I was like, oh, you know, that's really neat. And I remembered immediately what my dad used to tell me when I was a kid, that in the Bible it says where two or more are united in prayer, that God is in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. So I put my cell phone alarm on so that I would remember to pray. So I put it for one minute before 12, and... I, I was praying, and I was praying for my family, for my dad, and I didn't know that as I was praying, three men with guns robbed my dad at gunpoint and took everything from him and took his truck, and the guy that had the gun in back of his head asked the other guys, what do I do with him? And the guys told him, waste him. And my dad said that at that moment, he heard this loud voice that said, run, if you stay there, they will shoot you. And this was going on at 12 while I was praying for my family and asking God to take care of them. Because of me praying during the pray down, that, that was why my dad was not killed. Mm. And I just wanted to let you guys know that. And my dad called me yesterday to tell me that they caught the three guys and they were driving my dad's truck. So they haven't been arrested. Wow. Ugh. Man. I'm glad you were praying, Angie. I, I am too. I, I just, I couldn't believe it when, when my dad called me. He waited for me to get out of school because he didn't want me to get scared. Mm. And he told me that, and I, and I asked him, the first thing I asked him, I was like, what time did this happen? And he said it was noon. Oh, wow. <laughs> Angie, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're a blessing to us. Well, it's thank good you. to know Dad's in God's hands all the time, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's good to pray. <laughs> oh, Amen. yeah, girl. Amen. <laughs> all right. Well, God bless you. Thank you. Wow. As she was praying, her father was being robbed, almost shot, had she, he not heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the girl believes that in her praying, the robbery was undone, and her dad was safe. When the thief comes to steal your assurance, when the thief comes to make you feel guilty and to feel bad about your past, pray that the robbery will not happen, that you will stay intact, that that forgiveness will be there to carry you into a realm of holiness. You don't have to be robbed because prayer can break the power of what the enemy would tell you, that you would believe what God says and not what he says. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Wow. Let's respond by praying. Uh, it's time to pray. We've heard about prayer, now let's do it ourselves. And you can pray right there in your seat. But many of us found it to be a powerful experience to get out of our seat and come and kneel at this prayer altar railing up here. And... Uh, Come, bring your 40-day requests and pray those back to God. Um, come and tell God all the things that you've done and receive his forgiveness. Uh, come and bring any bitterness that you're harboring against somebody else and forgive those people. Um, 
If you come up here and pray, we're going to leave you alone unless you'd like one of us to pray with you. And the symbol for that is to cup your hands while you're at the prayer altar, and we'd love to pray with you. I'm going to be down here praying. I invite you to come. Come on. Maybe the person that you need to forgive is sitting in your chair. It's surely been hard for you to accept what you did. But his forgiveness is powerful enough for you. Maybe you need to forgive God because he let you down. Your loved one died. Something happened and he didn't intervene and just say, Father, I forgive you. And accept me back into a right relationship with you. Uh, this morning, I had to forgive cancer. I hate cancer. Not only does it take precious loved ones, but it took my dog a couple of weeks ago, my nine-year-old yellow lab. So I was upset with cancer. But I want to forgive even it so that in, in my life, no Velcro attracts anything, but I can walk cleansed of all unrighteousness. Now, finally, I'll, I'll close. I wasn't supposed to do this, but he's kneeling and praying so I can get away with it. Uh, the, the denomination has asked me, the upper room, to mobilize prayer for our denomination for our next general conference in the year 2016. So my plan is simple. I'm going to ask people if they'll pray at noon in behalf of the United Methodist Church, that that prayer has sub substance to it and the cadence of it could not only protect, but renew and revive 
our denomination. So I wonder how many of you would, would try to pray the Lord's Prayer at noon in behalf of this cadence to do this. Put your phone alarm on or some way to remind yourselves and after about 30 days, you won't need anything. You'll just pray at noon. And we won't be robbed as a denomination, but the robbery will be foiled and we'll head out to sea to fulfill the Great Commission. Thank you so much.